Okay. So yesterday we began learning this mimer, and we just to go briefly over what we've covered so far and where we are. The mimer is based on the pasuk. Therefore, these days are called Purim because of the lottery. And our question was, Balshandev teaches that the name of everything expresses its essence. And the essence of Purim is a holiday, it's a celebration. But the lottery that the Pasuk is referring to is a lottery that Haman made. And he made this lottery with the intent of destroying the Jewish people. So it doesn't seem something to celebrate. On the contrary, it's part of the decree. So why is it that we are um, why is it that we are uh, celebrating this uh, lottery of Haman? Not just that it's part of the celebration, but that it's the essence of the celebration. And all the wonderful things that happened on Purim are all a result of the lottery. So to explain this, we introduced the uh, famous concept of Yem Haki Purim that Yom Kippur is called a day like Purim. And which means that not only do does Purim and Yom Kippur have a commonality, but that Purim is in, is in fact even greater than Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is only like Purim. So what exactly is their commonality? So we did mention yesterday two things. Number one, that both Yom Kippur and Purim have a lottery. The one that we mentioned about Purim and Yom Kippur has a lottery, the lottery on the two goats to determine which goat is offered in the temple, which goat is cast off a cliff, La So you have a lottery by, by Purim and a lottery by Yom Kippur. Another thing that they have in common is, is that both Yom Kippur and Purim are associated, are connected to a revelation of godliness that is infinite. Yom Kippur, is a day where it says in the Torah we are we achieve a purity before Hashem. Chassidus explains the words before Hashem mean mean even higher than the name you give up. Okay, on Yom Kippur, there's a revelation of Hashem's essence beyond the way Hashem contracts Himself in the spiritual cosmos in the name Yud Kivavke. And Purim also has a relationship to that level because. Purim is a in the Megillah, the reason that one of the reasons, or perhaps the essence of why Hashem's name isn't men- mentioned, is because that's in the, on Purim there's a revelation of the infinite light of Hashem, which is beyond the names. So those are the two things in Kippur and Purim have in common. Now we explain how these two concepts are really connected. The reason why Yom Kippur and Purim have a lottery is associated in the, and as a result of there being a revelation of godliness. What's the connection between the revelation of godliness and the lottery? So we, so what we learned yesterday was that just like a human being makes a lottery to decide what he is going to do, so the lottery is, is the starting point upon which his mind is going to function. He's going to decide to approach something based upon the way the lottery's result uh, comes out. So in a similar way, a, um, a lottery in heaven, this level called lottery, which we'll discuss more what that means, level called lottery is associated with something beyond the spiritual cosmos. It's higher than uh, Chachma, Vatsilus, beyond the level of Vatsilus. And from there is emerges the levels of Vatsilus, etc. So, so the the revelation of godliness, which is the place of the lottery, is the um, is the reason for is a place which is beyond the spiritual cosmos. That's just like by a human being, a lottery is something which is beyond our logic. We don't know what to do, therefore make a lottery. So to a lottery is associated with the revelation of godliness, which is beyond chaf, which is beyond the level called wisdom. That's how these two concepts of there being a lottery and there being revelation beyond the Shtalashtalos um, are connected. Now we're going to go up to Is Gimel. It's known about a lottery. A lottery is not only beyond logic, a lottery is also higher than desire. 
In the spiritual cosmos, the first of the ten spheres of Atsubos is a level called Chachmut, level called wisdom. Higher in the level called wisdom is Keser, desire. A lottery isn't only beyond Chachma, a lottery is also beyond Keser. Why? What's the proof that a lottery is higher than Keser? Because when a person makes a lottery, what is he saying to himself? I'm not sure what I should want. The way the result of the lottery will be will indicate what direction my desire will be. I'm going to want whatever the lottery dictates. So it's not only dictating what, how I should think and how I should approach things. It's also dictating what I should want. That indicates that the, that the lottery reaches a level beyond the level of desire, and that's why the desire is a result of the lottery. That is the Lamailo, so too is this in the analog. In heaven, just like it is by us in our lives, that the, the lottery dictates our desire, so too the level that we're calling lottery is beyond the level called desire. There is Hashem's desires, then there is the Baal Haratzin. There is the one who has those, those desires, the one, the source of desire. So the lottery is related to not just to the level of desire by human being desire if you want something so then you think a certain way if you, if you are on a jury and someone bribes you or you're bribed because of whatever natural prejudice you have in this case so your natural desire or prejudice will dictate the way you think in a similar way there is there is a level called desire in heaven and that's his source for so to speak, the logic in heaven. Then there is the one who has a desire, the source of desire. Just like a human being throws the dice to figure out what should I want. So the meaning of the word lottery, we're talking about the Abishter, we're talking about a level called the source of desire. Not the desire itself, but the Balharat, the one who has those desires. Well, in Hashem's name, there are four letters. The four letters correspond to the four parts of Atsilus. Chachma and Bina, Midis, Malchus. Then there is the koits, literally that's called the thorn, that's on top of the letter yud. The letter yud has also two parts. There is the there is the uh, the crown on top of the letter yud. That crown or that thorn on top of the letter yud re represents not the level of chachma. That represents the desire of Hashem, which is higher than chachma. That's so when we say that in Yom Kippur and Purim. There's a revelation higher than Havaya, higher than Yudke Vavke, not only referring to the general way that Yudke Vavke is referred to, the Sphere of Silos, we're even referring to the highest part of the Yud, which means the Ratz, the desire that on Purim Yom Kippur, there's a revelation of the infinite light of Hashem, which is higher than the level called desire. Based upon this, now that we've explained that on Yom, that on Purim Yom Kippur, we, that we have a revelation, which is higher than the level of Ratzon, the higher than the level of desire, now we can explain the connection between the two translations of the words Yom HaKippurim, the day of atonement, and we learned in this Mimer, the day like Purim. We're going to see how the fact Yom Kippur achieves atonement is because it's a day like Purim. What does that mean? The word Yom Kippurim literally means a day of atonement, a day of cleansing. On that day, all negative things are cleansed, are, are washed away. 
Vishayyim Zev Kamei Purim, another translation of Yom Kippurim is a day like Purim, a day like Kippurim, who Hashem Purim Pilon Gero, Kippurim Purim Hashem Purim Hagero, and the similarity between Purim and Yom Kippur is, and of both of them, we have this concept of a lottery. On Purim, we had the lottery of Haman. And in Yom Kippur, we had the lottery of the two goats. So what's the connection between Yom Kippur's healing and purification element to its similarity to Purim, to its lottery? We're going to see how the lottery of Yom Kippur is what causes the atonement. What does that mean? When is there a perfect atonement? for those things that we've done against Hashem's will, how could there be an atonement for things, things we've done against Hashem's will? Only by drawing on and connecting to the source of that will. There's an analogy, an analogy that Ever Hashab gave, which goes something like this. A king makes an edict, and everyone has, is meant to keep the edict, including the king's family. And the prince of all people is the one who transgresses this edict, and he lives in some town in the king's kingdom, and the mayor of that town sentences the prince to death because everyone's meant to keep the edict, including the king's family, and uh, that's the punishment. So the prince manages to escape the guards, and he goes back to the king himself, and he says, they're talking about me. So the king says, oh, you, of course not. And he, he, he annuls the edict. There is, so to speak, the desire of Hashem. That, in the analogy, that's the mayor. There's the way Hashem expressed himself, which we're also obligated and we're connected to Hashem's desire. In this world, the way we connect to Hashem is through the mitzvahs. But then there is another way we connect to Hashem, and that is through tshuva. We're not only connected to Hashem because of the mitzvahs that we do, we're also connected to Hashem because we're Hashem's children. It doesn't matter what a child does. He's always a child of his parents. There's no, nothing you could do to take away that connection. So on Yom Kippur, what's revealed is not Hashem's mitzvahs. Hashem expressed his mitzvahs on Har Sinai, on Mount Sinai, when he gave us the Torah. That's the day of expression of God's desire. On Yom Kippur, there is an expression of the one who has those desires of the essence of Hashem, who is the source of those desires, and the essence of the Jewish people. As we learned yesterday in Yom Kippur and Purim, that's when Hashem says, doesn't matter what, what has happened between us till now, nothing can take away from our connection. <clears throat> so the reason why Yom, Kippur and Purim, why Yom Kippur has this healing and cleansing element is because Yom Kippur is revelation of the source of desire. I just want to point out, just it's obvious, but to point this out, when we talk about the level called lottery, we can't use in anthropomorphic uh, images over here and think that there's something, there's a level called lottery and there is a, some kind of, you know, like, like a, a, a dice chamber in heaven. What we're referring to is, we're referring to the source of desire. Talking about a level in heaven, which is the source of Hashem's desire, not the level called desire. Desire itself is a contraction of Hashem. Rather, we're talking about the way Hashem is not contracted and not filtered through his desire, the source of desire. So from the source of desire, which is analogous to a lottery, because just like our lotteries in this world predict what we're going to want, so to the level called lottery that we're calling lottery means the level which is higher than desire. That's where atonement comes from. Let's, let's go a little further. Uh, this is a connection between the two translations of the word Yom Kippur. The Yom Kippur is like Purim. It has a lottery. That means that Purim and Yom Kippur are, have the following in common, that both of them have revelation of the Baal Harats, of the one who has the desires, of Hashem himself. That's what they have in common. That explains why it's a day of atonement. Why is it a day of atonement? Because there is a revelation of the lottery. There's a revelation of the level beyond desire. There is a way Hashem trying to connect us through mitzvahs. On Yom Kippur and Purim, there is a revelation of the source of desire, which is higher than mitzvahs. And therefore, from there, there can be an atonement for all the failure that we have had in mitzvahs. 
to Yom Kippur is the day that's like Purim and has something of this lottery level, the level beyond Yom Kippur, higher than Yom Kippur, higher than Ratz, and higher than Desire. And that's why Yom Kippur is day of Kippurim and day of Atonement. Everyone follow so far? Okay. Um, this explains why the atonement of Purim is even greater than the atonement of Yom Kippur. The atonement we have on Purim is even greater than Yom Kippur. Now, I know not everyone uh, is familiar with that before. Who heard that before? On Purim, there's an atonement. It, it seems like now we're like in the month of Elul. If, if Yom Kippur is the day of Atonement and before that were the day of days of El to prepare for it. But certainly days of Adar are something that we are meant to do something to prepare for the incredible atonement that we receive on Purim, which is even greater than the atonement of Yom Kippur. How first of all, how does what does that mean that Purim is greater? What what has been a greater atonement? What what are we talking about? What's 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 the bottom line that Purim is a greater atonement? If you're atoned, you're atoned. You're not atoned, you're not atoned. What, what does it mean? It's a greater atonement. The way to be forgiven in Yom Kippur is only if you do tshuva. There's an argument between the rabbi and the chachamim. If you need to do tshuva to, 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 uh, to achieve atonement in Yom Kippur, the Allah is like the chachamim. Yom Kippur only forgives you if you do tshuva. And how is there a kapar on Yom Purim? Is there a day of tshuva? The day of introspection? Purim is a day of joy. The main concept of a lottery is on the days of Purim, that, and these are the days which have this lottery. This is a day of the lottery, and therefore the atonement that happens in Purim has no limitations. And Yom Kippur is only like Purim. It's only similar to it. And Yom Kippur only forgives you with Shuva. But Purim causes a forgiveness and atonement even without the Shuva. Without Shuva. On, on Purim, there's already a sense of cleansing and purity and connection without the Shuva. Because Purim is a day of the lottery. It's a day when this is revealed. Yom Kippur has some of this revelation, but there's a, a uh, conditions. In order to, to uh, get the atonement on Yom Kippur, you have to Shuva. On Purim, there's an atonement without the truth. Let's see, note 26. Uh, you guys are afraid of the fine print in note 26, right? Well, maybe we're going to lose out on this, this incredible uh, offer over here. Let's look at the fine print. Don't worry, nothing, nothing's going to be lost. Yom Kippur doesn't cause atonement for everything. Number one, we learned in this past summer, uh, the Bryce of Rabbi Shmuel, but the three things, three different transgressions and three different kinds of atonement, the atonement for positive mitzvahs is through tshuva, the atonement for leisa, say for negative commandments, is tshuva plus Yom Kippur, and the atonement for violating one of the Christus Mrs. Bezin to violating an Isser Kares, to violating something which is punishable by death, or Kares, according, is not only Yom Kippur, there also has to be chas shalom pain. So Yom Kippur doesn't forgive for everything. And there's also a fourth thing that's mentioned in the Bryce of Yishmol that's not mentioned in Tanya. And that is that if someone desecrates Hashem's name, uh, his kapara is through death. Someone calls Achil Hashem. So the kapara is through death. During Purim, although the sin was that they enjoyed the Milamach Hashvedish, it says the reason why they were punished was because that they enjoyed that meal. Uh, which was desecrating Hashem's name in public. At the meal, there was the uh, a lot of things that were against, that were desecration of the Beis HaMikdash. The, they used the vessels of the Beis HaMikdash at this party, and Achashverosh adorned himself with the breastplate of the Kayin Godel. And so there were, it's an open desecration of God's name, and open desecration of what was holy. So it was a Chil Hashem in public. And therefore, the usual rules are that's great Hashem's name in public. The rules are the only way to be atoned for that is death. However, they were forgiven for that too. Because 
So certainly, Yom Kippur doesn't do everything. Yom Kippur is limited. It can't forgive without pain. It can't forgive for um, for Chil Hashem. But on Purim, there was a forgiveness for those things as well. And not only that, even in those things that Yom Kippur does work for, like transgressing the Lysa, say transgressing the negative commandments, there's still a condition. On Purim, without any conditions, there's already a day of forgiveness. Without the truth. So, just just I want to mention um, we've met I learned this past summer. I just want to don't know, uh, leave this uh, people with the wrong impression. Although the um, Alter Rebbe Zegar Satshuva uh, addresses the three types of kapara and omits the Chil Hashem, the Alter Rebbe starts off Zegar Satshuva with there are three. It's we learned in the end of Tractate Yuma. Now. He's not really talking about something which is mentioned at the end of Tractate Yuma. It's a few pages before. The very end of Tractate Yuma discusses the ideas of Chil Hashem. So the Alter Rebbe, like the Rambam, we find them all other Svarim, write things which are novel in a hint, things which are obvious, he says straight out, and things which are novel, things which are big chiddush, he alludes to that. So the Alter Rebbe, by writing the words, the end of Tractate Yuma, He's alluding to that although there are some things that seem that tshuva cannot fix, but that's only if you're talking about a lower kind of tshuva. But there is nothing, says the Zohar, that stands in the path of tshuva, and it's always possible to fix something. Even Chil Hashem, even the creation of Hashem's name, it's also possible through a tshuva law, through a, a real sincere tshuva with love, to rectify even for a Chil Hashem. So that's regarding Gersa tshuva. Regarding what we're saying over here is, on Purim, there is a, 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 a cleansing rectification for everything. And the rectification isn't with tshuva, it's just with the day of Purim. I, I think I shared this story with you before, but briefly. Um, there was a guy who was engaged with to someone from Los Angeles many years ago. And he was, he was from a uh, very religious family in Yerushalayim. And he came here in the 50s. And the shidduch that he had come here to celebrate didn't work out. And he was left in Los Angeles in the 50s without with nothing to do. And uh, he really had a hard time being, he came here you know, with the whole Yerushalayim gear, the whole Jerusalem dress with the kapot and everything. And uh, he had now to contend with survival over here when, in an era when keeping Shabbos was uh, something that just, didn't allow you to find work. So little by little, he drifted away from Yiddishkeit. And make a long story short, he ended up coming to Crown Heights for Purim to celebrate Purim with a family, with his family. He had, he had relatives and he had not, he had not been in, in a synagogue in, in a quite, a, quite a long time. And uh, he came there as Fabrengen. And he really enjoyed it because Rebbe was speaking in Yiddish. He knew Yiddish. He knew, and, and he knew what Rebbe was talking about, the, the, the concepts of the Gemara. Rebbe was explaining it. It was familiar to him. And then the Rebbe started, suddenly started to talk about another concept. Rebbe started talking about the power of Mordechai Yehudi. Mordechai, it says about Mordechai, he did not bend. He did not bow before Achashverosh. Mordechai before Haman. And the Rebbe spoke about how a person could experience a spiritual downfall. And the Rebbe described his life. A person might say, the Rebbe says, a person might say that Torah without work can, can continue. As it says in the Mishnah Prakiyav, you can't continue with Torah without work. You have to go to work. And then the person says, well, if your life depends on it, you have to allow to break Shabbos. And the person starts, starts rationalizing why his life is in danger. He has to break Shabbos. And this guy is thinking, well, wow, this is this is really, really familiar to me, but the Kambi Rebbe is talking about me because how would he know me? And but it sounds so familiar. And then the Rebbe says, and it could even be that uh, someone from Yishalayim who was very Ephraim could even break him Kippur. Yerushalayim in general means full Yerushalayim is made up of two words, Yare Shalom, complete fear of Hashem. So a person's full of reverence for Hashem, and yet comes Yom Kippur and he breaks Yom Kippur. And this guy was like, wow, this is the first time he ever broke Yom Kippur was that year. But then the Rebbe says, comes the days of Purim. And on Purim it says, 
A Purim, it says, a person does not bow or bend. The Kmarachai did not bow or bend before Hama. So it reveals in a Jew something that Yom Kippur could not reveal. Purim reveals something in the Jew that does not, it's not revealed even in Yom Kippur. Like Yechali Yishtachavah. And, and the guy's like, whoa, this is, but it can't be that ever means me because how could he pass? And, I, and he was in a place in, in, in the room that he couldn't, he couldn't possibly be observed. He was like behind people. <laughs> and ever said, and even when he's here, he thinks he's close but not seen. Now the guy was like, uh-oh. Uh, the deal was up. However, he at least felt better about the fact that nobody else knew what I was talking about. But then they were finished talking and they returned to him and said, Say Lachai. He wasn't really was used to drinking, but Rebbe said on a full cup. So he took had to take a full cup and he sent the night in 770. And um, he didn't come back physically uh, till after Gimel Tam was to go to the oil, but uh, but he came back spiritually. That 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 that, that, that what what Yom Kippur didn't accomplish, Purim accomplishes. Purim reveals and it does something that even Yom Kippur cannot cannot reveal. And that's that's why Purim causes such a great great kapara because it reveals something in us. Any questions or comments? Can you say that we deserve a greater revelation on Purim because and and uh, when we got the Torah, basically there was such an outpouring of love we had no choice whether to choose God or not choose God or whatever because we were bound up in all the love that God poured into us. Uh, the analogy of the mountain, whatever. But on Purim, we had a choice. Basically, uh, some people, they had a whole years to basically say, I'm not Jewish, God forbid, and you are not subject to dying. Or the person that you, but somebody's not subject to dying, but nobody did. Everybody stood, we're, we're Jews and whatever, come what may, we're gonna stick to it. So we, it was like a full acceptance of God on Purim a fuller acceptance than what happened at Har Sinai. So maybe we deserved to have a fuller uh, tshuva on Purim than on Yom Kippur. I don't know. Yes, it says that the, the revelation of Purim is a result of the mysterious nefesh that they had throughout the year. It says that that's, that's what triggered this revelation. We'll discuss the Mitzvah more, more in the, later on in the moment. Very good. Okay. A great day, Rebari, great day, Mechomorcha, great day, Rebero, great day, David. Thank you,